19 minutes before the hour now, more on President Trump calling for a congressional investigation into his claim that, <clears throat> excuse me, former President Obama ordered officials to tap phones at Trump Tower during the election. President Trump has offered no evidence to back up that claim, and some lawmakers from both parties say they haven't seen any either. Let's turn to the Oklahoma Republican Senator James Lankford. He's a member of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. Sir, nice to see you. Thank you. Good to see you again, Chef. This is the sort of information that members of intelligence committees would, by matter of course, have word on. Do you have word on it? No, I won't talk about what we have word on, what we don't, but I would tell you we're thoroughly researching all of this and walking through the entire investigation that's happened with Russia and the campaign and all that goes along with it. So we will most definitely walk through this and we'll most definitely uncover uh, whatever is out there on it to be able to make sure that we get it clear. On Twitter, President Trump accused President Obama of a crime. Is there evidence of it? Not that we've seen uh, evidence of that, but uh, we'll, we'll, again, we'll, the White House, I'm sure, will be able to document to us what they have seen and what they're aware of. We'll walk through this in the normal course of our investigation as well. The White House has not elaborated, should it? Uh, sure they should. Uh, the White House should make clear uh, what they're actually putting out there in place, uh, both why they would put that out in the public arena and then also to be able to put that out to us so we can work through the classified documents with this. Because anything like that, uh, there would have to be a tremendous amount of overreach uh, happening in our own government. Our own government, it is against the law to, to be able to wiretap a private American citizen and to be able to listen in without a warrant. You're not going to get a warrant to be able to do anything that was described there. So we're trying to be able to figure out what happened. Uh, if something happened, that's obviously a serious legal issue. And so, yes, absolutely, the White House should cooperate with us in our own investigation to be able to get that. And so we can walk through the details as well. So, Senator Langford, you're calling for the White House to release the information that backs up this claim. Yeah, at least to us in a classified setting, that should be a given uh, that, we would, that we would have access to all that information that they have so we can walk through the investigation to be able to clear this up one way or the other. Did the president handle this matter in the appropriate way? The president handled this matter the way the president likes to handle the matter. He likes to speak directly to the American people. He's done it by Twitter uh, for a very long time on it. He handles it uniquely his own. Uh, now, the questions come from to his own staff and to the people around him. What does he mean? Where's the backup to that? That's the natural question. Sure. When you lay an accusation out there, everyone wants to know what's the facts behind it. That's a reasonable next question, but we'll see how he handles it. But he handles things uniquely his own way. He certainly does. It appears the information or the suggestion came from an alt-right website and a conspiracy theorist. The President of the United States, any President of the United States, has the option of calling the head of the FBI, the CIA, the National Intelligence Director to ask questions like this. Would that have been a more appropriate way to handle this? That would be a good first step. That would be the step that we would take, certainly, from the Intelligence Committee in the Senate uh, to be able to walk through and to be able to get all the facts and the information and be able to have that out in front of us uh, to be able to walk through it. You believe there's a possibility that this happened? And I ask, Senator, because if this did happen, if what Donald Trump, President Trump says is true, then Barack Obama committed a crime, or, or there was a FISA court order that showed probable cause that somebody in Trump Tower colluded with, for instance, the Russians on money for the campaign, as has been the suggestion. It's one or the other. Right? Right. Right. It would, it would have to be because a FISA court has to go through this. The President of the United States, post Watergate, cannot just call for a wiretap and to be able to do that. This has to go through an extensive process. It goes through a court system, just like any other warrant. If there's a criminal investigation, a police department can't go just put a wiretap on a phone. They have to go to a court, show probable cause. They have to be able to prove their case, and then the court allows them to do that. The FISA court is also just like that. These are not bureaucrats on the FISA court. These are judges uh, from around the country that volunteer that seat season of time to be able to serve in the FISA court, then step back into their normal court uh, responsibilities. And so th this is a very strong with heavy oversight process uh, because it's exceptionally important that the American people trust what happens in a FISA court because it is a secret court dealing with intelligence information. General Michael Hayden had a thought on the origins of this today. Listen. The President of the United States put his own reputation, the reputation of his predecessor, and the reputation of his nation at risk to get at least a draw out of the next 24 hours news. To get even coverage on the next 24 hours of news, what think? Yeah, that I couldn't even begin to guess, uh, to speculate the motives on it. It could be very well that the president was getting information and he was just going to be able to push back on it. I don't know, uh, but we'll find out in the days ahead. Most certainly the truth, as you know, always comes out. W on the Russia matter, uh, writ large, Senator, o over time, certainly, people of all administrations have had contact with, with Russians and Russian officials and the Russian ambassador and all the rest. We have not in history seen this amount of lying and obfuscating about contacts. 
and, and changing of stories after things became public. How concerned are you about the, the larger Russian interference with the election part and, and the contacts of people within Team Trump with Russian officials? Yeah, so we're, we're doing a very thorough, very bipartisan investigation on the Intelligence Committee, both in the Senate and in the House. We will, we will release a bipartisan report to be able to say these are all the facts that we found. This is really in several parts, though, and people are starting to combine them all together. There's no question the Russians were trying to interfere in our elections. There's no question with that. Where there are questions is, were they cooperating with anyone here in the United States, with the Trump campaign, any other individuals? Most of those stories have been unnamed sources out there. I've never seen so many unnamed sources. We're trying to actually get to the actual information and the background on this to be able to settle. No question again the Russians were trying to interfere in our election. There is still a big question on what the role of anyone within the Trump campaign had in that and we want to try to get to the bottom of it and to settle it once and for all. But and we need to settle it in a way that is clearly bipartisan so the American people can trust the information because as President Obama said in December, there's a lot of it that's classified. They were walking through sources and methods. Sure. We can't release all of it so we have to have a good report that people can trust and know that there really is a bipartisan agreement for those of us who have seen all the source documents. Well, with your point that the people need to know this information in mind, we know there are transcripts of some of the communications between the Russians and members of Team Obama. Should those be made public? No. No, we, we, we should not try to release out some of this. We I, should I try meant to Team keep Trump. Well, I understood what you meant, actually. But yeah, that, we, we should not try to have any kind of release out on that unless it's heavily redacted. The issue that we're always going to face is in intelligence operation, and we're talking about foreign intelligence, not trying to spy on an American citizen. That's against the law. But anytime there's an outreach to try to examine what's happening in another place, and it's no grand secret that we're trying to listen to the Russians just like they're trying to listen to us. The great reminder of that was the Russian spy ship traveling down our coast just a couple of weeks ago. So there, there's no surprise that we're trying to listen in on their conversations. The issue is anytime we can protect sources and methods of how we do it, that prevents the Russians from being able to figure out how we're doing it. That's a reasonable, good thing to do. So any information that comes out has to protect our future operations, not just deal with the past. You mentioned it needs to be appropriately non-political. Would you advocate then, given that, for a special prosecutor in this matter? Oh, I would not. Uh, the reason would be is because the, the Select Committee on Intelligence in the Senate is a very bipartisan committee that works together. We all have top secret clearance. All of our staff already has top secret clearance. If you spin up a special prosecutor, you're going to spend six to eight months just getting staff together, getting clearance, getting organized, getting all the relationships. That's a two-year process to do what we started three months ago. Uh, so it would be much faster for us to be able to get to the facts with the people who already know how to get to the documents and have clearance for those documents. Again, it's a nonpartisan and a committee that we work with because we're all passionate about national security. Let us get this report out there and let the American people see it and then evaluate from there. Thank you. Senator Lankford, today North Korea is in the news. More missile testing. We're led to believe more may be coming. Our North Korea expert has said that the North Korean leadership is unstable, which is a, a known known. Uh, and the former president told the current president, according to the reporting of the Wall Street Journal, that he would have to at some point make a decision on whether to use uh, military force with North Korea. Your level of concern there as a member of the Intelligence Committee uh, and how high a priority this should be. Yeah, it should be an enormous priority when we deal with uh, North Korea. They're a very unstable regime. Obviously, it's a tenuous time in South Korea, as many of your uh, followers will know very well. South Korea is in the process of having a dealing with an impeachment of the sitting president. They've got a transition of the leadership in South Korea that's happening one way or the other. So it's tenuous in South Korea and their transition of leadership. It's tenuous in our relationship. The North Koreans are trying to figure out how committed we still are to our strong ally, South Korea, and then they're very aggressive. Uh, they always try to, the North Koreans always try to blame their aggressive actions on our military operations in the region. That's a false argument. We are only doing military operations in the region because of how aggressive and unstable they are. We know we have to be prepared and to be able to be a deterrent. So it's very good that we be able to stay there and to be able to stay engaged in that agreement long term. Republican Senator Russ, uh, James Langford of Oklahoma, member of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, live from the Rotunda. Sir, I greatly appreciate your time and thank you. Glad to be able to do it. Thanks. Rex Tillerson is executive about to announce the new executive the order on immigration. Let's today. listen in. Protecting the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States is a vital measure for strengthening our national security. It is the president's solemn duty to protect the American people. And with this order, President Trump is exercising his rightful authority to keep our people safe. As threats to our security continue to evolve and change, Common sense dictates that we continually reevaluate 
and reassess the systems we rely upon to protect our country. While no system can be made completely infallible, the American people can have high confidence we are identifying ways to improve the vetting process and thus keep terrorists from entering our country. To our allies and partners around the world, please understand this order is part of our ongoing efforts to eliminate vulnerabilities that radical Islamist terrorists can and will exploit for destructive ends. The State Department will coordinate with other federal agencies and implement these temporary restrictions in an orderly manner. Our embassies and consulates around the world will play an important role in making sure that our nation is as secure as it can be. And the State Department will implement the provisions in this order that allow for the admissions of refugees when it is determined they do not pose a risk to the security or welfare of the United States. Upon the President's initial executive order issued on January the 27th, the State Department's consular affairs and diplomatic security offices immediately undertook a review in coordination with the Department of Homeland Security to identify additional measures that would strengthen our vetting of those seeking entry to the United States from seven named countries. These early efforts were concentrated on Iraq. Iraq is an important ally in the fight to defeat ISIS, with their brave soldiers fighting in close coordination with America's men and women in uniform. This intense review over the past month identified multiple security measures that the State Department and the government of Iraq will be implementing to achieve our shared objective of preventing those with criminal or terroristic intent from reaching the United States. I want to express my appreciation to Prime Minister Al-Abadi of Iraq for his positive engagement and support for implementing these actions. The United States welcomes this kind of close cooperation with countries in every region of the world who share our commitment to national security. This revised order will bolster the security of the United States and her allies. Now we spent the morning briefing the Congress, the press, and we will continue to talk with key stakeholders this afternoon. Experts from the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, and the State Department hosted an hour-long call with the media on this topic this morning. Our collective teams will continue throughout the day to follow up with the Congress, the media, and stakeholders to answer your questions. I'll now turn it to the Attorney General for his comments. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and good morning to all of you. One of the Justice Department's top priorities is to protect the United States from threats to our national security. Therefore, I want to discuss two points. First, the national security basis of this order, and second, the Department of Justice's role in defending the lawful orders of the President of the United States. First, as President Trump noted in his address to Congress, the majority of people convicted in our courts for terrorism-related offenses since 9-11 came here from abroad. We also know that many people seeking to support or commit terrorist acts will try to enter through our refugee program. In fact, today more than 300 people, according to the FBI, uh, who came here as refugees are under an FBI investigation today for potential terrorism-related activities. Like every nation, the United States has a right to control who enters our country and to keep out those who would do us harm. This executive order seeks to protect the American people as well as lawful immigrants by putting in place an enhanced screening and vetting process for visitors from six countries. Three of these nations are state sponsors of terrorism. The other three have served as safe havens for terrorist countries, countries where governments have lost control of their territory to terrorist groups like ISIL or Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. This increases the risk that people are admitted here from these countries may belong to terrorist groups or may have been radicalized by them. We cannot compromise our nation's security by allowing visitors entry when their own governments are unable or unwilling to provide the information we need to vet them responsibly. 
or when those governments actively support terrorism. This executive order responsibly provides a needed pause we can, so we can carefully review how we scrutinize people coming here from these countries of concern. Second, the Department of Justice believes that this executive order, just as the first executive order, is a lawful and proper exercise of presidential authority. This Department of Justice will defend and enforce lawful orders of the President consistent with the core principles of our Constitution. The executive is empowered under the Constitution and by Congress to make national security judgments and to enforce our immigration policies in order to safeguard the American public. Terrorism is clearly a danger for America and our people. The President gets briefings on these dangers and emerging threats on a regular basis. The federal investigative agencies, the intelligence community, the Department of State, the Department of Homeland Security, and the United States military report to the President. Knowing the President would best possess such extensive inf information, our founders wisely gave the executive branch the authority and the duty to protect the nation. This executive order is a proper exercise of that power. Now I will turn things over to our able Secretary John Kelly of the Department of Homeland Security. John. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Well, like the uh, Secretary of State and the Attorney General, I welcome you here today. Uh, my comments will be relatively brief. Last week, the Department of Homeland Security celebrated its 14th anniversary, first opening its doors on 1 March 2003. This uh, secretariat was established in response to the devastating attacks of September 11th, when foreign terrorists turned a beautiful but ordinary day into a nightmare. Those attacks taught us that we could not take our nation's security for granted, that homeland security must be our top priority, and that we needed to overcome our collective inability to, take the, to connect the dots of intelligence and arrange them into a more comprehensive picture of the threats posed to America and our way of life. Though much has changed over the past 14 years, both in the world that is more dangerous and at DHS, which is much better. The fact remains that we are not immune to terrorist threats and that our enemies often use our own freedoms in generosity against us. Today's executive order, which President Trump signed this morning, will make America more secure and address long overdue concerns about the security of our immigration system. We must undertake a rigorous review and are undertaking a rigorous review of our immigration vetting programs to increase our confidence in the decisions we make relative to visitors and immigrants that travel to the United States. We cannot risk the prospect of malevolent actors using our immigration system to take American lives. This executive order is prospective in nature. Its focus is on preventing the entry of new foreign nationals from the six designated countries. Accordingly, it is important to note that nothing in this executive order affects existing lawful permanent residents or persons with current authorization to enter our homeland. Unregulated, unvetted travel is not a universal privilege, especially when national security is at stake. The White House worked closely with the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, and the Department of State to create an order that addresses previous concerns and protects the homeland and every one of our citizens. The men and women of the Department of Homeland Security, like their brothers and sisters throughout law enforcement, are decent men and women of character and conscience. They are no less so than the governors of our states and territories, of our senators and members of Congress, of our city mayors and various advocacy groups. These men and women are sworn to enforce the laws as passed by the United States Congress and would be in violation of the law in their sworn oaths if they did not do so. We do not make the law, but are sworn to enforce it. We have no other option. We are going to work closely to implement and enforce it humanely, respectfully, and with professionalism, but we will enforce the law. 
I want to thank the President for his leadership on this issue and for his steadfast support for our important law enforcement, security, and counterterrorism mission. Again, as previously mentioned, I have spent much of the day today on the phone with members of Congress, the leadership, explaining the ins and outs of this EO, and I did the same thing last week. So there should be no surprises, whether it's in the media or on Capitol Hill. Thanks very much, uh, and thanks for your time. So with all the headlines about what Jeff Session told the Russian ambassador and what he told Congress and what did Mike Flynn tell the Russian ambassador and why are we only learning about this now and what about this other former Trump campaign aide and it does seem like we're not getting the full story and that of course is making journalists dig harder. Uh, they're sort of uh, uh, like bloodhounds on the trail. Of course the trail may be leading nowhere. But let's take a step back. And let's try to figure out what is driving this story. Well, obviously, it's got some sexy elements, FBI investigation, Donald Trump, secret contacts, or at least undisclosed uh, contacts with the Russian ambassador, who seems to have been a popular guy here inside the Beltway. But I think there's actually two driving forces. And one of them is partisanship. Democrats are pushing this story hard because they think that it might raise questions about the way in which Donald Trump won this election amid the Russian hacking and uh, perhaps undermine his presidency. But there's something even more fundamental than that, and that is the following. Donald Trump made clear as a candidate, and he is making clear as president, that he is going to pursue a very different approach toward Russia and Vladimir Putin than has been the case under Republican and Democratic presidents for the last 25 years or more. He sees less of a need for an adversarial relationship with Russia. He sees the possibility of more cooperation. He has said nice things about Vladimir Putin. And this has shocked and horrified the foreign policy establishment. When I say establishment, I'm talking about the sort of Council on Foreign Relations, Foreign Affairs Committee types of both parties, remember Trump ran against the Republican establishment as well, that thinks this is a terrible, horrible idea and that may be behind some of the leaking here. Uh, and so there is this sort of mindset that, well, why is Trump being so friendly to Russia? And does that mean uh, that there were some secret deals and, is, and the fact that Jared was involved in a meeting? There is just sort of this suspicion without any evidence at this point um, that there may be something sinister. And I think as journalists, since we can't prove that, we have to resist that. Now, it's fine to ask the questions about who met with whom where. Uh, and when you do have the Attorney General of the United States, because he didn't give a complete answer to the Senate Judiciary Committee, recusing himself from this FBI investigation, that's news. It's not fake news, folks. And if Hillary Clinton's Attorney General had done the same thing, many of the people criticizing this story would be up in arms to know more. But I do think that Trump didn't make any secret of the fact during the campaign that he was going to take a different approach to Moscow, a different approach to Putin, and he won the election anyway. And so I don't think that um, partisans or some journalists should be using uh, these stories and this investigation as a way of trying to undermine him uh, in his approach to Russia. Every administration takes a different approach to Russia. Hillary Clinton had the famous reset button when she was Secretary of State. It could, could turn out, and even Trump has acknowledged this, that the relations between the U.S. and Russia are going to go downhill despite efforts uh, uh, by both parties uh, to have a more cooperative relationship. That could happen. The guy's only been in office a few weeks. He's talking about a witch hunt because he sees this whole thing as political. My point is that to the extent we should have, absolutely should have, a, a vigorous national debate about what should be the U.S. policy toward Russia. But it shouldn't be through the back door of trying to discredit the Trump administration um, by looking at all these previously undisclosed contacts. Now, it would help matters if people like Flynn and Sessions and others would just uh, tell us what happened. If they would just go, if they would just decide they're going to get it all out, stop with the drip, 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 that would help uh, bring this story perhaps to an end because I don't know the FBI is going to find anything. We shall see. Uh, but at the same time, I do think there's a sort of official Washington revulsion against Trump's foreign policy, particularly as it pertains to Russia. And I think that is the hidden driver of this whole mess.